Hey, Teresa, thanks for your response. Um, I really liked a lot of what you had to say, and I'm going to clarify what I was trying to say to uh, Jasper Avi. But first, I, I want to uh, you know, acknowledge how brilliant that idea is, that the reason this person's um, phantom limb was, was activated when he was shaving his cheek is because uh, when we're, you know, in, in a fetal development, that's the natural position that the, the hands tend to take next to the cheeks. And uh, so whatever, somehow the internal uh, neural wiring, neurogenesis is mirroring the exterior uh, proprioceptive uh, structure of the body as it is, you know, in gestation. But I think, you know, to say that we are just a ball of sensory perceptions is, it may be missing something important, which is that we're, we're also a ball of sensory perceivers. You know, neurons are uh, cells that, that have their own sophisticated kind of consciousness, quite sophisticated. Um, they're not on-off switches, you know, they're uh, living pharmacies, you know, they're, they're part of their uh, pharmacological activity is to make themselves as well as to communicate with other uh, neural consciousnesses that make themselves. And somehow they form a ball, which it's not just a ball, it's actually an emergent uh, state of higher order, you know, personal consciousness, human personal individuality is somehow produced by 100 billion neurons, uh, you know, spitting various chemicals on one another. It's, it's, uh, it's astonishing, and I think you're right that um, neurology has a lot of interesting things to tell us. You said neurology has the answers. I wouldn't quite uh, say that uh, go that far, at least if, if you mean to say that they have all the answers. Um, and this gets into sensory perception. I don't think empirical investigation can ever tell us um, most, in fact, of what is interesting about reality or nature or experience, or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Because if we're going to say that somehow all our experience is based on sensory perception of an external world, um, to construe the situation that we're in as biological entities, living creatures, in, in that way, I think misses something important, um, which is that our bodies are active participants in the bringing forth of worlds. Um, and it's not in the sense that, like, our thoughts create reality, or that, you know, when I don't look, uh, the world behind me is... In, in the quantum state of superposition, and only when I look at it does it collapse and take a particular form. I'm not saying that. Uh, life has co-evolved with the earth, with the materiality of the earth, uh, and living beings have always been structurally coupled to this environment, this planet, uh, and it's been a co-evolutionary unfolding, not uh, organisms having to fit into pre-existing niches in some objective environment. Life makes its own environment. Um, you know, think about like, the Gaia theory. And, you know, why is this relevant to sensory perception? Well, we've got the, a history embedded in our cells, right? It's been evolving for billions of years. And before we ever open our eyes, that is predisposing us to certain archetypal uh, psychological structures. So, you know, there's a relationship between soma and psyche, obviously, between body uh, and soul or mind. Um, but we can't, I don't think, reduce one to the other. That would be, un, uh, it would be to oversimplify something that is very complex. Um, so, you know, in terms of brain processes, though, 
if you think about what the retina receives from this so-called external world, um, you know, it's it's sending this information to the lateral geniculate nucleus, right? And so if, if the idea is that we're going to be receiving information about the world, um, and that that's going to constitute our, our conscious states, um, what it misses is, uh, I'll show you a diagram here from uh, Francisco Varela and Humberto Maturana's book, The Tree of Knowledge, Biological Roots of Human Understanding. And so if you look here, I think, I hope you can see this. Uh, you see the retina there feeding uh, stimulus into the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is already being stimulated uh, by the, the cortex, the superior colliculus, um, the reticular nucleus of, of the thalamus, the locus, uh, coriolis, and the hypothalamus, right? So actually 80% of the neural activity reaching the lateral geniculate nucleus in any given moment, uh, while the eyes are open, is not from the eyes. Only 20% of the information is actually coming from the retinas into the lateral geniculate nucleus. So what we actually experience has more to do with what the brain was already doing endogenously, internally, than what happened in the outside world. Um, and so not only are we not just sensory perceptions, um, a sensory perceiver is a sensory motor uh, apparatus. It's, it's uh, not just receiving and passively trying to represent or build an inner model of the pre-existing world. Organisms participate in the making of worlds. Uh, a living being is a world-making creature. Uh, still material, but materiality, uh, you know, is not some inert, uh, non-experiential, and uh, <clears throat> you know, stupid, unintelligent substance. It's actually a rather. It's not a substance at all. It's a process, and it's it's evolutionary and its intelligence comes from its evolutionary uh, tendencies, which is it's rather ironic considering the way intelligent design and uh, neo-Darwinism are so uh, at each other's throats because, yeah, of course evolution is, is valid. All life on Earth shares a common origin. Um, but that doesn't mean the process is entirely algorithmic, entirely mechanical, based on, you know, pure random mutation uh, of genetic molecules. There's also an intelligence at work. Uh, there's consciousness. There's awareness. There's experience. There's desire, uh, which isn't just selfish desire. It's also a desire to evolve, to become even more uh, interiorized and intelligent. There's a tendency towards cerebralization, at least in uh, primates. And, you know, it's, it's an odd thing in a universe that's purely mechanical and algorithmic uh, for that to happen. Um, so, uh, and, you know, to sum up, I don't think our our philosophy, which includes more than science, uh, you know, if we're going to try to understand our existence as human beings, science is going to be helpful, but it's not um, going to provide you with a full picture of, of human experience. You also need philosophy and psychology and art and spirituality and, and religion, and wisdom traditions. Uh, <clears throat> so, I guess that's that's all I have to say. Uh, I really appreciate you making a video, uh, Teresa, to, to bring up Oliver Sacks and um, uh, Phantom Limbs and you know, the importance of neuroscience, because it is important, but I think we have to look re really carefully uh, so as not to um, take for granted this sort of Cartesian representationalist understandings of the mind that are assumed by many neuroscientists. You know, in other words, that the brain is a computer or information processor whose job is to represent